Tokozani, Magu, Namaste, Selbona, I see you and recognize the divine in you, in me, in all of us. I am Gogo Tulegani. I'm a Sangoma medicine woman, priestess, seer, diviner, time traveler, and all of the great things that my ancestors have created me to be. I am devoted to the ancient ways of the ones before me who were healers, wisdom keepers, who understood the stars, the warriors, and I am a keeper of the wisdom of the elements of nature. This audio series, Ancestral Dreams, Omens, and Prophecies is a gateway or a sacred space to see our dreams as teachers and helpers for those on a spiritual journey by demystifying the ancestral realm, our subconscious, and to build bridges between our individual dreams and to share what fuels and inspires my work as an ancestral healer. Thank you for joining the journey. In today's episode, I will be sharing some dreams perspectives based on some messages sent by the wonderful community, as well as opening up the gates for a conversation about the divine feminine energy and sacred sexuality, um, what it means to me and us. So I hope you enjoy it and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Tokozani, we are back with a few dream perspectives based on the uh, messages and experiences that my beautiful community has shared with me. And um, this person kind of set, sent two um, kind of separate instances. And I want to start off with her baby dreams. Um, I think the last time I did a dream perspective, it was a there was one dream about babies. Um, so I'm going to try to just and I and I think this dream is kind of coming from the same um, interpretation, but I figured let's let's just talk it through. Um, she writes, I had a few dreams of babies too. They didn't feel like mine, but I felt very close to them, holding, feeding, and teaching them. Once in a dream, I opened a door and there was a baby in a high chair crying. I gave her a bottle and she was playful and smiling with me just before I woke up. Another dream, I was holding a giant baby, but he was so slippery, like he had a bunch of baby oil on or something. He was trying to slip away, but I kept picking him up over and over again. A few days after my dream about the baby girl mentioned above, I found out that my brother's girlfriend was pregnant, but they're keeping the reproductive sex of the baby hush. So um, the main thing that I want to share here is mostly just connected to what I've spoken about before on this podcast about our dreams kind of showing us where we are um, subconsciously and and consciously in our lives. And um, babies can represent a lot of different things, um, at at least specific to people. But in general, we have this general (laughs) understanding that babies are a gift. Babies are um, something that we nurture. They are um, something that is very... Um, significant to the future of humanity and they can also be metaphorically speaking projects um, or certain things in life that we are currently nurturing so if you are a firefighter or um, a doctor um, you know your baby in real life your creative project may be those houses um, or working on a truck or your patients um, in a hospital Um, so to me this this series of dreams around babies is speaking about the things in your life that you nurture and the things in a life that you are part of um, creation. And it's a positive sign because in each scenario you are doing, you know, wonderfully, you are feeding them, you are nurturing them. They, the baby is smiling back at you. And I feel like it's a message from your subconscious that you're doing mm, a good job. Um, And it's interesting because with the last child who was very slippery, Mm -hmm. It can kind of show an idea or a project in your life that you are trying to nurture, um, but despite what you're doing, Mm -hmm. despite your abilities, um, this particular child has a slippery nature about it. Yes. And so it can be useful to attach that to something in your life that you um, 
are doing and you're doing well, you're doing it like you're doing everything else, but just the nature and the energy of that um, circumstance or that project or um, creation is just slippery in nature. So yeah, that's my perspective. I I definitely do feel like um, baby dreams can be prophetic in the sense that um, you, you could be tapping into the baby that is coming into the family. Um, but just looking at the series of dreams and the way that you wrote it to me, um, that's what I see. So next, um, she shares, uh, she shares a lot here. And, um, the question is, is not so much as much about interpretation, but about what she's, how she's experiencing her dreams. Um, so let's just start off with what she said. Um, I've had many dreams where my ancestors were showing me places and said things like, this is where I do my work. And I look in and there is a vast space of absolute darkness. I've been told that's where this person lives from a kind of space like flying vehicle. I've been in a forest with an ancestor teaching me about plants and all of these places feel like classrooms, but I struggle with remembering important details like the teachings, names of people and plants. Sometimes I'm awake in my dreams enough that I'm dreaming, but like clockwork, the first thing I think about in the dream is I need to remember all of this and write it down. My thinking mind comes in and during the dream, I'm taking notes on what to remember. It's challenging to stay present in the dream. I'm stressing to remember what I'm experiencing and I wake up trying to match how I feel to the bits and pieces I do remember. All of this to say that I need to figure out how to calm down in the dream to relax. When I realized I needed to relax on dream rituals, um, I, uh, she started to remember them. So her ultimate question is how to stay present in the dream space. Oh, it's a good one. That is the right kind of question to ask. And um, I have a few responses and just perspectives. Um, First of all, it's, you know, as she stated, and as I've talked about on the podcast of this idea of being in school in our dreams and tapping into spaces where the ancestors are showing us things and um, pointing out the origins of things and starting to reveal things to us. Um, So I feel like she's very clear about that. Um, and so it's about remembering and dream recall. The first, (laughs) the first thing that I will say is that, um, being awake, being conscious, um, being an awakened being is a very profound concept. And the only space corners in the world where I really hear about awakened beings is like gurus, and um and monks and i i resonate with that because monks in particularly in the east they have renounced themselves from the world like that is a part of their protocol that is a part of their initiation they no longer dress like everybody else they cut their hair they're meditating and fasting at um at a much greater frequency than the rest of us. Um, Some of them just go off into the mountains for days and months at a time. Um, And then some of them are living day-to-day lives, but they still, their whole way of life is still reprogrammed in a lot of ways. And to me, a part of the question, a part of the answer to this question is like, if we live like monks, <laughs> it would be easier because there's not as many distractions. There's not as many responsibilities. Um, our mind is spread out into a lot of things. Our families are this, are that. And monks renounce attachment to a lot of these things um, that distract us and the overeating and the food and the this, that, and the third. Um, but I, I also mention this because I, you know, uh, many years ago, I did um, a 10-day Vipassana retreat. And Vipassana meditation is a, is a meditation that was created by a um, guru or master named SN, SN Cuenca. And um, he teaches this particular style of meditation, one of the best meditation styles I've ever learned for reasons I'll discuss later. But um, he... Um, offers these as like his his nonprofit or way of working is by offering these free retreats all around the world for people to participate in, um, and so 
It's 10 days. You meditate for about eight to 10 hours, not straight. You you meditate for like an hour or two, and then there's a break for lunch, and then there's another hour or two of meditation, and then on and on and on until the day ends. And the whole retreat is a silent retreat, so you don't talk to anybody. Um, this was early, early in the game for me when a lot of my senses weren't activated or heightened yet. And um, we woke up early in the morning every day, went to sleep at a good hour, And it was almost like that monk life. And let me tell you, even though this meditation style isn't about having visions much, um, it's actually about just clearing, clearing, clearing all of our karmas and um, the sankharas is what he calls them, the illusions and the emotions and things. And I mean, this 10 day period, I was woke, woke, woke. Like I, my dreams were so clear, so vivid, so deep. Um, my meditations think, you know, and I'm an air sign. I don't, I didn't consider myself to be a person that has a bunch of visions, especially in meditation. And, um, that was the most awake that I was in, in the dream, especially around that time. And sometimes I just feel like, you know, I've also gone through periods of time where I felt like I just wanted to quit this world and in the, in the monk sense of renouncing and just being in the mountain and just letting go of all of this extra stuff. Um, but I also had this realization about how that is very, I won't say that it's easy in the sense of that I'm disrespecting that path or anything, but it is easier, you know, and I don't believe that all of us need to go off into the mountains and cut ourselves off from family, friends, TV and everything. I do believe that we can walk in both worlds. Hmm. Um, and so because we are choosing to walk in both worlds because we are working because we are building families and all of the things all of these things I feel like we have to have a little bit more of a relaxed or realistic um, ideology about how we're growing on this journey and how we're experiencing things um, and how awake we can be moment to moment one of the um, foundations of being awake is mindfulness and I remember when I first started to read about mindfulness and like how you can sit and eat a meal and be conscious of you know how it tastes in your mouth and slowly chewing it and all of these like techniques of basically just slowing all the way down um you know and I've just had so many realizations. You know how like you 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 walk in the house, you go from the kitchen to the living room, you come back to the kitchen and you're like, huh, when did I when did I turn off the light? You know, like just how forgetful we are, <laughs> you know? And that is because, you know, we do things without thinking, we forget this, forget that, and it's all a part of the sleep. It's all a part of the illusion. And if we could just If we work on in our day-to-day lives, just being more mindful, that is going to translate into the dream. Um, But ultimately, I feel like we have to release a little bit of control and be okay with how we're receiving things and the pace in which we are receiving things. The second thing that I wanted to mention around this is that we, well, I, I know I can say for myself what I know to be true is that some of the dreams that we're having are reruns. We're actually, not all of them, but some of the dreams that we're having are dreams that are coming back that we had before, whether when we were younger or a few weeks ago. Some of our dreams are reruns. And I know this because I have been awake in the dream and um, realizing that I, just in the midst of the dream, realizing that, oh, wait a minute, not only have I been in this place before, but I am literally reliving a dream that I already had Um and I, I was so grateful to have this experience because I was just like, man, the, the spirits, the cosmos, the ancestors, what, if they want you to know something, they're going to give it back to you um, for sure, 100. Um, third thing, and maybe the last thing that I will say around this is that when you, this is also a good indicator because if you're in a, in a time period where your ancestors are teaching you things, um, that means it's, it's, you know, you receive the plants, you received um, the names and the origins, and it's in your subconscious mind. Yes, it's like a seed that has been planted. And 
whether or not you dream about it again, whether or not you remember the details, it's going to come up in your day-to-day life. You know, sometimes we think that, hmm, we think that when we have like a realization or an aha moment, um, that that's just like random. But I believe that these random realizations <laughs> are synchronizations of the dream. Um, when someone just happens to give you um, basil herb, you know, for whatever reason, <laughs> um, as a gift, and um, you just start to work with it, or you know, all all the things that come across your path. Mm, Not all. I mean, a lot of the things that come across your path are working with you um, and showing up for you at times where you don't even realize why. Yes. Um, And I believe it's because it's 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 drawing from our subconscious. Like she may not remember the name of that plant, Mm -hmm. but that plant is going to come into her life. Yes. And she will start using it and she will start working with it. And maybe she will be one day connected back to this to this dream. Um, But I don't believe that we have to know on that level. Um, A lot of the focus and the connection that I have with the ancestors is with a deep acceptance of the unknown, a deep acceptance that um, like I'm really okay with not knowing every single detail of every single thing, um, because honestly, it would be too much. (laughs) <laughs> if, 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 if otherwise, but um, I really feel like this is also a part of the lessons and um, the blessings of the word surrender, <laughs> just surrender. Um, okay, the last, last thing that I will say is that um, you, I, this person knows and I know that, um, you know, some of us just have spiritual callings and we're going to go through Um, many initiations and rites of passages in our lives and um, life is really initiating us before after and during initiations Um, and so understand that more is coming and sometimes your ancestors yes are waiting for you to get in a certain environment and a certain space where you can learn certain things Mm hmm Okay, loves, I lied. There is one more thing that the spirits reminded me after recording that little segment about the dream perspective um, that I have to share. Yes. Um, And, you know, this whole conversation around dreams, I'm, I'm speaking about dreams as, yes, the experiences that we have at night when we sleep, but also visions, also the experiences that we have in the day, um, the meditations, and the various ways that we can enter the portal of the dream. And so our the way that our brains and our biology and everything um, that God has created in us we are wired to forget, so it is a part of our nature. You know, we forget who we are, we get born again and made babies and have to start all over and reset and reincarnate and over and over again. So forgetting is a part of the process of being human, right? Um, but what I really wanted to say is that um, a good, th- you know, with dreams, one of the reasons why we wake up in the middle of the night is, um, is because sometimes that waking up in the middle of of the night in between dreams is an opportunity to recall dreams because we have like various dreams throughout the night and we only remember maybe two to three um but when we wake up in the middle of the night um that kind of gives us the opportunity to remember what we just had and then go back into the dream realm and this is why some um lucid dreaming professionals um actually suggest waking up multiple times in the night I don't I've never done that I like my sleep I barely get enough sleep as it is um but my point is is that we also need to explore active dreaming um the different styles of of meditation that allow us to open up that vision space and go on journeys um is really really helpful 
Um, it's dreaming, you know, I'm all for it. I do it every day, but it's not my, our only source of, um, connection with the spirits. And so I, I just wanted to mention, and this is something that I really delve deeper into in the, the four week journey, divining your higher self, because we also need to connect with, um, the dream realm while we're like literally awake And, um, because that's, you know, there's just a great, there's also a greater chance for us to remember the experiences that we're having while we're in awake, while we're in ceremony, while we're in ritual. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, and I hope that that's clear and makes sense. Before we get into this conversation, I kind of want to lay the groundwork and the foundation by saying a few things. One, I come from a particular lineage where when you initiate to become a Sangoma, you are titled a Gogo. So whether you are a man, whether you are a female, you receive the title of Gogo, of grandmother. And the um, divine masculine or counterpart to that is is Mkulu. I could consider myself and call myself Nkulu because one of my guardian spirits is a male spirit. And so when you look at the African languages and spiritual contexts, you begin to understand that um, a a Sangoma, for example, is viewed as a male and a female spirit. Um, And there's this this neutralness about uh, who we are. Um, We understand that we have a physical body, um, but that we are a spirit and we affirm the spirit Um, all the time and it's interesting because a lot of African terms for king for example are not gender based because a woman can be titled and crowned king Um, so I'm coming from this background that understands that gender or sexuality or just how we identify ourselves is very fluid and that there are many 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 spirits with us It was really interesting after a a ceremony in Guatemala, one of the participants said to me, you know, I didn't even see you. I saw this male spirit. And, um, you know, in our traditions, the the men, they wear the cloths, they wear the skirts um, to represent their grandmother spirits and and the way that their spirits are manifesting um, in these times. So we wear the buys, we wear the lapas and the fabrics and everyone does, you know. Um, So I'm coming from this understanding that we are male and we are female. We are divine feminine and we are divine masculine and we honor all the spirits within us. Um, I'm coming from a, a mostly heterosexual background, a mostly heterosexual conditioning. So the terms and the ways that I identify myself is um, she and her Um, But I respect all forms of expressions and um, I'm just sharing from the space that I sit in. And in general, in this episode, we are metaphorically just taking off the teacher hat because on this topic, I just want to speak as a woman. I just want to speak as a soul and a spirit um, seeking truth on this spiritual path. Um, This episode isn't specifically about teaching and more about having an honest conversation. And in this honest conversation, I am bringing in a being of light, Gogo Ikaya Esima, my sister. She is also a Sangoma healer who does powerful work. I love her. I love her ancestors. We initiated together and... um, We have the deepest, deepest, deepest conversations that I've ever had in my life. And though we won't go too deep today, um, I'm happy to share her with you. And um, you may just get a more sillier side of me in this episode because um, we definitely always have fun and high vibrational um, vibes together. So I hope you enjoy this experience. All right, I am here with my sistrin, my CC, my go go bestie, <laughs> go go Ikaya Esima. Welcome to the sacred space. Tukosa. 
Jacosa, how are you? You, yeah, I am well, and I'm so grateful that you're letting me record your whole life story. Yay! <laughs> putting all my business out there. Putting all the business, <laughs> all the businesses out there for the whole world to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're here having an honest conversation about sacred sexuality and divine feminine energy. And one of the first things that I just wanted to open up the conversation with is what you what in your lifetime in general um pre becoming a healer during becoming a becoming a healer um any point of your life where you became conscious or aware that the feminine energy was something sacred or that sexuality was considered something divine mm. yeah i think the the first time that i actually experienced um sexual energy also being something that was Um, very sacred outside of just intuitively like being with partners and having experiences Um, when I first underwent initiation one one thing that my teacher told me is that all of the sexual energy that I had she said there's something about you you're very sexual you're very like um, expressive sexually and physically and now it's time for you to channel that energy time for you to bring that energy up from the root, the womb space, and all the way up through the physical and the auric body so that it can transcend into healing energy. And when she was telling me that, I was like, wow, I wonder how you do that. Um, And that began my journey in terms of like how I was going to utilize during the time of initiation. You know that we are like celibate beings, so we don't, one of the taboos is that you do not have sex during initiation or have physical contact. And um, without that expression of the physical and sexual energy, I learned ways of how to navigate that same power and that same divine energy up towards something that was going to help break something up, manifest something, help destroy something that needed to be destroyed and rebirth. Um, All the cycles of how what our wounds do in terms of like the way the moon cycles are the the way we give birth the way we manifest we can also use that same cycle in our healing work so yeah that was the first time yeah beautiful um for those of you who are just new to this conversation altogether um it's kind of a common philosophy that sexual and spiritual energy are one in the same energy. So even when we go into altered states of consciousness and we experience that kundalini rising experience, it correlates to the way that sexual energy also moves from our root chakra up to our crown chakra. And um, one of the things that uh, made me aware <laughs> about sexual energy and feminine energy was long before I even started to learn and study about ancestors, I came to um, certain teachers that focused on Tantra, on sexuality. And I even um, watched this really, really old movie where one of the women, um, it was about this couple, and this woman was having this really hard time in her relationship she was kind of like um I don't know if psychologists would call it like manic or you know just kind of out of her mind spacey and she started to seek out a a tantra therapist in the movie and so she would secretly visit this therapist to get tantra therapy and help on her journey and her husband started to pick up on it and he secretly went to see this this spiritual doctor (laughs) and um wanted to know what he was doing with his wife and Ultimately, the Tantra therapist started to teach him what he could do to help his wife. And so they started to practice sacred sexuality. And in engaging in sex, in sex from a conscious space, a lot of memories started to come to this woman that helped them understand why she was having these mental health issues and why she was, hasn't been able to connect with her husband. She was able to have a, a memory about something that happened in her childhood, and it just really opened up her sexual energy and freed her. And um, Gogo, one of the stories that you've shared with me was about an intimate experience that you had with a partner many, many years ago that brought about a dream or a memory um, that I would love for you to share if you are willing. 
Woohoo! Yeah, absolutely. There was a person that I was with and um, and had been with for some years. But as I was going into my spiritual journey and understanding who I was and getting into energy and spirituality and learning more about myself, um, we had been intimate um, one particular evening. And I went, interestingly enough, into an altered space, state. Um, and while the intimacy was taking place, I, my whole being, everything, my vision, my physical being, everything was back into, went to another lifetime where I wasn't me. I didn't look like myself, but I was, it was definitely me in a different life. And then my partner was also a different person, but also him. I knew it was him. And we were back in Africa and we were in a hut together and we were having this very beautiful beautiful intimate moment and it was very ancient and it seemed like many many generations ago you know my particular ancestors have been on this side for so many generations but it went further back to when we were in Africa and I had this lifetime experience um, with him and it was a very beautiful and a really explosive moment um, in terms of like mind-blowing um, because I got to really sense some power within myself and understanding that with sexual energy, we can travel. We can go back in time. We can go forward and manifest. We can work on things that are here and now in the present moment that need to be addressed all through that intimate connection with our partners. And this was very spontaneous. I had no intentions. I had no, you know, it was just like I was completely thrown into that space and and then we were able to share and talk about it. And it was a profound moment for both of us. And it really opened us up to something different and how we can use the power of our sexuality to to know, to learn, to grow our history, to, 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 to move through the present moment and also um, manifest things and transmute things on the ancestral and in realms in the future. So goes that. That was deep. Um, so we, for those of you who don't know, Gogui Kai and I went through our initiation together. And we, we, we went through some things together. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. struggled. We cried. We danced. And all of the things. Um, and so when we get out of initiation and we're starting to live our lives at Sangoma, um, I have to make fun of Gogo Kai because... <laughs> Her one of her number one concerns <laughs> was that now that she got all these ancestors vibrating and coming through and making sounds and all of these wonderful things, she was concerned about what her, you know, sexual experiences would be like moving forward. Like, what if I get intimate and go into altered states of consciousness and my ancestors are making sounds while I'm being intimate? <laughs> yes, that is a true concern that was a true concern you know like um because I had read a book a while ago about this man it was uh that was in South Africa at the time and he was initiating become a Sangoma and I don't know but at the time he had been intimate with somebody and his ancestors came up during the and he felt himself change into a ancestral being and seemed like the ancestor was also a part of that sexual activity. And ever since I read that, I was like, oh no, like I want to be just me. I don't want to have ancestors in the room. Like I really just want to, you know, have that space and that intimacy with my partner. And um, yeah, so it was a concern that, you know, in in our tradition, you you notice that when Ichlozi comes up or the ancestral guardian comes up within you, they can make different sounds. You know, I have a very masculine ancestral uh, spirit guide that's with me. And I was concerned that I'd be, you know, turning into a masculine <laughs> energy or a masculine being during that time. But I feel like there's also a way for you to create space and say, you know what, this is my sacred time. And the divine spirits will respect that. Or if you want to, there's some people that are very interested in inviting the ancestors in or um, being that wild, divine, feminine being in every way. And I and I affirm that I, I think it's amazing to sit in that energy of the wild, divine, feminine, um, but definitely um, would like the masculine 
ancestors to step back if I <laughs> <laughs> please <laughs> Don't let the tables turn in the intimate moments, right? <laughs> but um, definitely just allowing that divine feminine energy to come forward. And if we need to howl at the moon, then we howl at the moon, you know? And we be, like, very um, confident and beautiful in those moments. Um, and I'm sure it'll be well-received by your partners, so. We hope. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very beautiful. I mean... I I always kind of thought about it, you know, they say that sex is magic and I kind of thought about it as like, you know, what I'm saying, what I always say is opening portals and and finding out what's possible because even though it doesn't really sound like a good idea, ancestors being involved, um, healing can happen on multidimensional levels if we are open and conscious um, about it. So I'm still curious. Um, one of the things that I know about you, Gogo Ikaya, is that you have a lot of goddess energies with you. Um, one of the energies that, a lot of the energies that have come through to you have been goddess spirits through, you know, some of the Orisha traditions and even recently having a really deep connection with Ishtar. Mm -hmm. And I... Hathor. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Hathor. The god is Hathor. Mm -hmm. And so I know this is an ongoing journey, but is there anything that you can... And I think that at least as African spiritualists, you don't hear... I mean, you hear a lot about Oshun. You hear a lot about Yemen Ya. Um, maybe even Mami Wata. Um, you do hear about some of the African goddesses. Um, but I was just wondering if there is anything that you would like to share about just any of your experiences with the goddess energies from an African background um, and what that has helped you understand about who you are as a woman or a spiritual being or a woman with feminine energy. Hmm. That's a really beautiful question, and I want to answer that in two parts. So I want to talk about something that actually just happened today um, in terms of working with a with a, a person around fertility. And um, as I was in that session today, the the um, lady and I, you know, of course, I I give much respect to her process. I'm not giving any names, but there was a person that I was working with. And had some issues with uh, miscarriage and also wanting to bring forth a child in the womb space. And when I go into sessions, I don't, uh, you know, I definitely honor all the divine spirits that walk with me, the ancestral guides that walk with me. Um, but who came through was um, an older um, Peruvian woman that, that sometimes I see her um, come through a grandmother spirit. And she was telling me that she was a midwife and that she wanted to come through to help her um, midwife, the unborn child, the child that she had recently lost, um, and guide her to the light and then open the womb space. So what she did while I was in the trance space, she was uh, singing these old ancient archaic languages. And then the... the um, other midwives start to come around and they put a red cloth over the woman. And we know red represents what? The blood. It represents femininity. It represents the divine feminine. It represents the the blood that we shed. It, it, re it represents the removal of obstacles. It represents the quickening, the fire. And so they put this red cloth over her, uh, draped it from her feet all the way up to the womb, all the way over her top of her head and just surrounded her with this beautiful energy of red protection and then um they started to sing and the the divine mother started to um work um use their hands uh, yes, on an energetic level and work um in, with the energy of the womb to give her her womb space support um to give her womb space the the strength and the agility to carry forth a new another child, uh, a healthy child in this life. So that was one of the things that was very touching to me. And then again, in each session, I never know what's going to happen. I just allow um, the divine spirits to work. Um, on a on the the other part, the other answer to that question that I wanted to talk about was um, 
you know, I recently have been over the past year worked with Nzunza Spirits, um, which is part of the Sangoma tradition. It's um, Nzunza Spirits are um, like the mermaid um, energies, the merman energies, the spirits of the water, um, the marine spirits. So it can represent uh, many different marine spirits, uh, the animals there, the dolphins and different um species connected with the the waters and the stars. And I noticed that when I uh, recently went to South Africa this past time, those spirits, the way that they dance, it's very feminine. It's very divine. Like as soon as uh, we called Nzunza spirits in, they move in a very beautiful and sacred way and their dance alone is healing. So anyone else sitting in the room, anyone that you're have intentions for or praying for at that time, they're going to receive the power of that feminine um, dance, that flowy dance that, that happens naturally in the water that we can witness when we go to the ocean and we see the waves moving back and forth. It's very sensual. It's very powerful. Um, and, and as us as women, you know, I'm a Pisces. I'm flowing with water always, right? Like always in that energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was, it's very beautiful to see those spirits, you know, um, of the mermaids and the divine ocean spirits and river spirits to come through and really shake up some things uh, with their with the feminine power. So close up. Yeah, so listening to that, I what comes to my mind is a lot of sensual energy that comes with the you know the feminine energy and the ancestral mothers um and how powerful that energy can be used to transform and heal mm -hmm. um and kind of shifting but continuing this conversation about um sexual energy and dating as a sangoma or as an african traditional healer there are some people who kind of think that um, women, especially who are traditional healers, are kind of loners and don't have partners or have issues in dating. And um, I remember at one of our women's retreat, the, the, we were just working on something casually and one of the women asked, so what is dating like for you all? <laughs> and me, I laughed. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, and it, 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 I have had periods of time where I wondered, well, do, do the ancestors want us all to themselves, or what, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I, one thing that you just brought up was about attraction, and what attraction kind of means for us who are intuitive, for us who are healers, or, or us who are just spiritual beings. Um, what you want to share, Gogo? Yeah, I was just thinking about attraction and how <clears throat> over the years I've noticed that there will be this immense attraction to someone. And um, at the beginning of my journey, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so attracted to this person. Wow, you're so amazing. And, da, 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 da. and then, you know, the ancestors were also showing me that there's a difference between a physical and relational attraction that one may have and an ancestral attraction. They can feel very much the same. You get the same feelings inside of you when, um, for me anyways, you get the same, I get the same feelings inside of me when I would have an attraction for someone versus um, witnessing their, their spirit or witnessing like truly who they were on a, a spiritual level. Um, so, so when clients come, when people come, you may feel that vibration. And again, that's a time for you to utilize that energy, bring it up through the system so that it can transmute and heal. Um, yeah, so there is there for me, it was very difficult at the beginning to recognize when there was just like this attraction for somebody that I had and I really liked them versus an ancestral attraction, meaning that they needed uh, there was some work that needed to be done or there's something that my spirits wanted to be able to support them with or give them. And that was quite confusing. But after a while, I began to get a little bit more discernment about it. And then I just checked, I would check in like, okay, is this, is this just, you know, is this just about the ancestors or is there, is there something else um, to this? Um, and that clarity just came for me. Like there wasn't like, 
an exact um, cue or an exact system that I had to go through to say, oh yeah, this is it. It's just, it took time. It just took more practice and be like, oh, okay, this is definitely my ancestors. They're speaking to me now and this is what it is. Um, and you know, when it was something that was for me, um, I feel like that's, that is also very much known and very clear at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think I wrote a post on Instagram a while ago about how our attraction to one another can mean a lot of different things, even that sexual attraction. It could mean that this person has really strong ancestors and your ancestors are recognizing their spirits and remembering them from you know another time. It could be that y'all are meant to come together for some business. It could mean a number of different things. And if you don't sit with it and allow things to unfold or check in with your, your, your guide or that inner guidance, then yeah, a lot of tangled situations Mm -hmm. can come about. And, and that's when we start to feel a little bit of a struggle because we're not paying attention to, excuse me, the soul contract that might actually be there on multidimensional levels. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the thing, you know, we're kind of talking a lot about the light side of this, mm-hmm. you know, with everything there is a shadow side. Mm-hmm. Um, what? Yeah, I was gonna just say on that on that same topic, I wanted to ask you something. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. How was how is like sex for you after being a Sangoma? How was that? Oh gosh, I was going to avoid sharing <laughs> any kind of stories until after, but. Um, Without going on a, on a really long journey of talking right now, um, for me, because of my journey, um, awakening to the energy of the ancestors, awakening to spiritual energy and, and the sensitivity that comes with it, right? Mm-hmm. Because you become more sensitive the more that you tune in. Mm-hmm. That awakens certain aspects of my sexual energy. Mm-hmm. And so... I, for me, there was a major transformation, a major healing in the ability to feel and sense and connect with people more deeply. Mm-hmm. And so to me, sexual experiences and intimate experiences as a Sangoma is lit, lit, lit. Oh. <laughs> Everything is heightened, yes. you know, and um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. It's just, it's, it's deeper. It's, there's more levels that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, here in America, we talk about a lot, at least in like the certain sexual circles about how a lot of women here are are shut down, Mm -hmm. who, you know, are not orgasmic for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, that was a big part of my 20s. And so when I started to do the healing work which involved womb work, Mm -hmm. you know, because that energy is coming from the root and the sacral chakra. Mm -hmm. The root is where the ancestors sit. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, it opened up a lot of things. It um, reawakened sensations. It um, just allowed the energy to flow Mm -hmm. because now I can feel and connect with sensual energy and understand that I can express it a lot of different ways because, Mm -hmm. because we've had a lot of times of celibacy because, you know, life is just life, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, you're not just able to have sex sometimes. So I've had to figure out other things to do Mm -hmm. with it as an energy, you know, it is an energy of creation. So I'm a very creative person, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and I understand how to um, just use the energy a lot of different ways, and but also just not be afraid mm-hmm. to have it and express it. Um, it has allowed me to be and feel more vulnerable. And I think that the whole conversation around attraction, it has allowed me to be more patient. You know, to me, being interested in somebody in an intimate way is not anything that has to be rushed into, you know, we think about soul, we get so excited about soulmates and mm-hmm. twin flames and we want to find the love of our lives. Like mm-hmm. I am patient. Mm-hmm. I don't need no drama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm willing to see what this, you know, feel the energy, but understand and sit with it and, and see what it means. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think that I'm, I'm very open to exploring um, at some point uh, you know, all of what it means because there is definitely more healing that can happen for myself and, you know, the world. Um, 
So yeah, I think that answers your question. That, sound, that sounds like you picked up a lot of wisdom in terms of like your growth since sex before Sangoma and sex after. It's like it also carries like the wisdom of the ancestors as well with you. Yeah, you got to. Okay. Got to learn someday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as I was saying, we are, we're talking about the light side and there's always a shadow side to everything. Um, they say that the womb is a, a very, you know, like all of the other chakras, it's a portal. And as women, we carry and hold, because we're receptive, feminine energy is more receptive than proactive, like the masculine energy is. They say that feminine energy receives and masculine energy gives, and that is the duality of it. So our wombs can hold a lot of trauma, it can hold a lot of emotions, it can hold a lot of woundings and things of that nature. And so it is a very sensitive space for us as well, for the shadow work and the healing work. Um, and you know, some of us have had difficult experiences around sex and that is one of the things that starts to manifest and come to the surface as we're exploring, um, the spiritual realm in the dream, in the, 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 the waking state. Um, and I know that you have a lot of not only background experience, but also lessons around healing the, the wounds of the womb. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Go, go. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as a, you know, in my younger days, I was, um, I was abused sexually. And so um, I carried a lot of those pains into my adult life and, and how I expressed my sexuality um, stemmed from that same abuse um, at, into my adulthood. So I would act upon and do things to try to um, unconsciously to try to either recreate a an abusive situation. Um, so I was um, definitely very exploratory at, at one point in my life. And, and there's nothing wrong with being exploratory. It was the way that I was seeking and doing it that was abusive to myself and my own spirit. And then once I had that time of celibacy, um, I was able to look into it f- from my dream space. So um, during my process and even after uh, my process is continuing. So um, I go into dream spaces and I realize some of the contracts that I had in the spiritual realm with different um, beings and entities um, that were unresolved and, and even with my with ancestors. So I was uh, sexually abused by my father and also other men that were close to the family. And I had to go back and um, when I would go into shamanic journeys and spiritual journeys, I would have to meet my father. Um, And every time that I would meet him, a layer would come off of me. Um, There was a lot of anger at the beginning where it was just like I was angry, I was yelling, I was upset. Um, But I was also carrying this gift inside of me in my dreams. But that gift inside of me wasn't able to truly express itself until I got over some of the pain and the trauma um, that I had in my visions that were a reflection of my real life, my, my daily life. And so my dreams took me through a whole series of different um, contracts and agreements that I had with spirits and entities in the spiritual realm. Because as when we are sexually abused, that you were talking about portals, those portals can open up and those portals can be vulnerable to other energies. So sexual abuse, um, those, those, those other energies will also come for you or like want to be around you because it's already been opened by another intruder. So there is spiritually, there can be other intruders that want to come through. And so there are some of the darker spaces, you know, you hear about women who say, Oh, I'm, I feel like I'm being sexually attacked in my dreams or I'm being pinned down Mm. in my bed. Or when I wake up, I feel like I can't get up because somebody's on top of me. You know, this is when you need to go see a healer to to figure out and divine for you and, and, and find out by the spirits like what needs to be done, what particular rituals need to be done in mm. order for you to release that intrinsic trauma that has happened to you, but also to release any contracts that you have unconsciously made in the spirit realm because of those traumas um, and any any energies that that are maybe attacking or maybe 
um, attracted to you because of that trauma, um, that all needs to be resolved. So the healing process for me was going into those darker spaces mm -hmm. and and witnessing, seeing them as entities and saying, I no longer have a contract with you. You can no yes. longer touch me. Um, I am no longer the abused child. I'm an adult. I am strengthened. Hey, I am in my power at this moment. And um, and I rebuke all of that. I rebuke all those old contracts. Yes. They are no longer valid. And um, you can begin to do that. But I suggest that if you are experiencing any type of um in its entities or in, you know any of the things that I just discussed that you see someone that has been through it or you go to a healer that has has this um, specific uh, way of helping you to address and resolve those problems because cer sometimes it needs certain medicines or mutis um, or certain rituals to be done on your behalf so that you can get through that not alone you don't have to suffer alone we have women that have been through it you know the whole gamut of things and then we're also healing ancestral wounds right so we talk about like the darker aspects of you know, as, as an African American, you know, some of our ancestors were raped, hissed, and pillaged. You know, in terms of the women, um, and 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 raped by the 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 white man and and different people. You know, and and incest uh, penetrating our lineages. You know, mm. so those things we do need to address, not only from a therapeutic level, but also from a spiritual level so that we can be freed up in our energy, in our own sexuality and be able to celebrate ourselves again. Um, because I also noticed through my process, not only that I was healing my womb and my own story in this lifetime, but there were other women that were coming forward in my lineage that were saying, you know what? I was raped. I was abused. I was suffering. And I had to cry for them. Yes. I had to be angry for them. I had to hiss. It, it, it was channeled through me and, and through that experience, um, th their spirits were able to elevate. Absolutely. And, you know, I was, a, you know, I've been in your life for uh, a good part of those experiences and, you know, was just an outside, you know, witnessing it on the outside. And one thing that some people don't know is that your father passed away a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So when you were doing this dream work and doing this ancestral work, he was coming as an ancestor. Yes. Yes. And um, being a witness to your journey, I, I can attest to the fact that it was a long journey. Yeah. It wasn't just one ritual. It wasn't just one step. It was like you would do one step. You know, you would have a dream or an experience. Then you would do the work, you know, and then another layer would come. And then another layer would come. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then you, like, actively doing this, like, the way that your father would come in the dreams started to change. Yes. yes. And what we talk about as elevation was something that you were able to witness. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it just it's so affirming about not only what is possible, but what is real and what we can get done. Yes. Yeah, boo. Yeah. I, I absolutely must say that it was not an overnight healing and everything is resolved. Woo, I did that womb healing. You know, when you've been traumatized... Um, that trauma builds over time and it seeps into your life every day, whether you know it or not, the interactions that you have with people, um, the interactions that you have with family members. And um, I thought, you know, I was like when some when spirit was like, we're going to bring your father back up again or we're going to bring this abuser back up again. I was just like, whoa, I thought I was done with this. I thought this was like I already forgave him. Mm. But what spirit was telling me that there was a deeper a deepening of the the forgiveness, a deepening of the forgiveness even for myself, mm -hmm. more compassion, and I had to to sit in those spaces and and see the journey from um, a detached space, you know, a detached from the body and my own memories and the trauma and the experiences, and see it from his a goddess space, you know, where I'm just looking over the situation, and then I was able to sit in compassion, sit in unconditional love and support not only for my abusers, but for myself. And that journey has taken years. And still to this day, there are things that memories that come up, you know, from when, when I was even a child that came up, you know, that I'm still getting through, but it is one of the most holy experiences that I've had. And I'm so happy mm -hmm. that I'm able to do it. So goes that. Wow. I don't even know what to say after that. <laughs> um, Wow. 
yeah, it's been a really beautiful thing to witness. Um, So we've talked about sexual energy. We've talked about feminine energy. Please excuse the background noise because we live next to a noisy road. Um, Yeah, I think that that is the heart of what I wanted to ask you and include you in. I feel like you said so much. Um, And there were some things that I wanted to share that I think I'll just do um, as a second segment, or if you want to ask me questions, well, I'm gonna give you a chance to ask me questions. <laughs> no, you know, I I felt like, um, yeah, I was able to to ask that question about, um, you know, how it's like for you now that you're a Sangoma, but I I think another question that's coming forward is your connection with your own womb healing. I remember you went to a particular person one time. Um, and and she worked specifically with womb healing and you said that it was a huge transformative experience for you and i feel like that was also the curi- the when the curiosity began for me when you shared that story about your own womb healing so yeah yeah so um there are you know there are a number of things that c- came up for me before I had this consciousness about ancestors. I was I went through a phase where I was really into Tantra, really into sacred sexuality, um, and it sprouted from a space of, of a need for womb healing. And I'm going to talk about this in the next segment. But um, <clears throat> one of those experiences is that actually um, there were two traditional healers that I, I had met before I, I twazed. And one is my Baba and the other one is this Ia or this Orisha priestess. And she has these um, retreats that she does around sacred sexuality and womb healing. And so I attended th- this, re- you know, retreat and we were doing all of these like sacred feminine practices. And um, some of it I, I knew about before. Some of it was new to me. It was definitely new to have like an African priest talking about these things for me. And this woman had this like we had the whole process that we did every day. But one thing that was consistent was like at the beginning, she gave us this womb tea mm-hmm. and we had to drink it throughout the, re- the the weekend. And we had a mason jar and there was this womb tea and um, it was very bitter. And if there is one recipe on the planet in my whole life that I wish I knew what was in them herbs Mm -hmm. it is that tea right there Mm -hmm. because not only the tea of course the practices but that when I talk about my journey opening and awakening sensations that Mm -hmm. opened up like the energies feeling the chakras feeling the sensations in the womb Mm -hmm. you know there's this one uh, love coach many many years ago that used to talk about womb wisdom Mm -hmm. Or womb choice. Mm-hmm. She would say that your womb has an intelligence, mm-hmm. and she chooses, or when you feel a certain attraction or a, a, an arousalness mm-hmm. towards a, a, a partner or a person, it's because that person has medicine for you, mm-hmm. or that person has money for you, or that person, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, you're feeling that attraction for a reason, and your womb is making you aware of it. Mm-hmm. And so I would hear her talk about these things on an intellectual level but after drinking that womb tea boy you know it just (laughs) you know it just awakened you know a lot of feelings Mm -hmm. and sensations and I would just you know feel sensual and spiritual energy more easily Mm -hmm. um and I forgot the question. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I got so distracted. About, it was about oh, that. yeah, yeah. And that she was just, yeah, it was just like, there were just, we did certain cleanses for the womb. Um, we we did like tantric breath work and meditations and partner things. We got really in touch with our womb. Like, you know, we did these exercises to like touch and see what is there. Because like, she also has this concept that like every if you look at the womb from a, an anatomy perspective like each quadrant of the womb, of our womb is like north south east and west mm-hmm. each quadrant of the womb holds certain energies or emotions mm-hmm. and so we can even massage ourselves in a way that is conscious and healing you know it was just an introduction to all of these deep things mm-hmm. um and then i had to twaza and shut all that down <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, Twaza is like, like, like Gogo mentioned earlier, you know, it's most of it is about celibacy. And so 
it was not good timing for me. I was just like, oh man, now I got to do this. Yeah. But, and I kind of hoped that, you know, there would be some type of lesson around, you know, sacred sexuality. But there, there are these things in our traditions. It's just, you know, that's not what Twas is really about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, there's just so much. There's so much that I could say. Um, a lot that I really need to sit. Uh, that's, I'm, so that's why I'm going to prepare the next segment and just sit with my thoughts. But um, I think that ultimately what it was that sparked, because it kind of sparked my spiritual journey. I was having womb issues and I became curious mm-hmm. and I started doing all this research. And it was fascinating to me that there is a feminine energy mm-hmm. that God can be seen as goddess or mother, you know, that a lot of the traditions that we come from once called God a she and a mother, yeah. and that there are temples where there are goddess sculptures, where there were goddess traditions, mm-hmm. where the priestesses were the, you know, the female priests were the highest priests. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like once I started to come into that knowledge, it dramatically changed the way that I see life. Mm-hmm. And that knowledge is when I started to feel like, why in the world? Do we step on this earth not knowing these things? Mm -hmm. Because when I think about my insecurities as a child and a teenager, Mm -hmm. it had a lot to do with my feminine energy. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know what I was doing when I started to be intimate with other people or even vulnerable and sharing who I was with other people. Mm -hmm. And it's like... um, you know, we talk a lot about how important rites of passages are. And I think that that first rites of passage is into womanhood is something that is so important to, to also be reinstilled beyond just, you know, the spiritual rites of passages that are there. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like the tantric teachings, the sacred sexuality teachings, this ancestral mother's wounding work mm-hmm. is something that is a big rites of passage too, and that we don't have to wait so long into our womanhood yes. to begin to do. Yeah, so I want to end that segment on that note. Tukosa. Thank you so much, Go Go, for sharing the goodies Thank with you. with me. <laughs> and Thank share. you for having me, and it's it's a blessing to be here, and also a blessing to to see all the beautiful contributions that you're giving on this podcast, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. Tukosa. <laughs> So Kozani, I hope that you really enjoyed this conversation with Gogo Ikaya, Esima, and myself. Much gratitude to her ancestors for being the powerhouse that she is and the wisdom keeper that she is and the fellow time traveler that she is. Um, yeah, I there's so many things that could be said on this topic. And um, so I kind of just want to close um, if there's something that we, we briefly mentioned that you would love to hear more about, just send me a message and let me know because I could go on and on and talk in more circles with you. Um, but I did want to mention something before closing about the spirit of our children because I did mention this on a pre- previous episode. And, um, and this might be all of these conversations that that we've had up you know in this episode can be very sensitive can be very triggering so i understand if you need to drop off on this part of the episode because i know when it comes to children that we may have lost through um miscarriages or abortions and things of that nature um it can just be very triggering and very difficult um one of the the from a traditional perspective we say that you know when anyone passes in any form or way there are, are certain rituals that need to be done and some of us haven't had the opportunity to do rituals around the spirit of children that you know haven't come through for whatever reason um uh and that's one of the the parts of my womb healing and my feminine energy journeys you know way before i knew anything about this healing journey um especially with the consciousness about ancestors you know i was a mother for a few months and it was you know for a number of different reasons um wasn't able to bring forth a child into this world um 
And when I started to do the spiritual work, it was something that came up to the surface for me. Um, And from a traditional perspective, there are certain releasing rituals that are done to um, release the children into the realm of the ancestors safely and peacefully. Um, And so when these rituals aren't done, it can create disruptions, not only in the energy field of that child, but also in our day-to-day lives. It can create issues with money. It can create issues with our relationships. It can create a number of different issues energetically um, when things are left unresolved and unsaid. Um, Even the spirit of children who um, weren't able to come through are named and honored so that they are well in the ancestral realm. Um, One of the things that, one of the experiences in the dream time that came through was very difficult. I have to say that this was intense. I had experience having being in like a surgical room and um, laying on a surgical bed and having to give birth to this child um, in the spiritual realm in order for it to be ushered into the realm of the ancestors. And so if you imagine like being in a hospital bed and being unconscious in some type of way, but hearing everything in the room. And in in my crown and in my head, I could hear all of these voices of like ancestral women and ancestral mothers who were basically talking about what was going on and the circumstances and making sure that the spirit of this child was taken to a better space in the spiritual realm in a better way. Um, It was very uncomfortable. I have to say that my mind, my body, everything was out of sorts, but it was something that I had to go through and breathe through. Um, And, you know, there are other experiences that have allowed me to really understand the importance of this level of work Mm -hmm. and the importance of acknowledging this aspect of our spiritual or our human experience. Um, And doing the work has elevated and shifted the relationship of the spirit of the children as well. It has given, brought me into states where I have now seen um, and related with the spirit of children in very positive and very encouraging ways. Um, We can have experiences of seeing them before they come, knowing what gender they'll be, or being given a name that the ancestors want this child to have. Um, All of these things are possible and real. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of also just wanted to to share this and and be open to being seen, being open to being vulnerable, because in my work, I'm inviting people into this sacred space to say things that are painful, say things that have been hurtful or even embarrassing. And so I, you know, wanted to share and, and be open and honest in this way um, because I do appreciate and I do recognize um, the significance and the sacredness in, in having these spaces to have these conversations. So um, that's the heart of what I wanted to share here today. Um, I think that I just want to honor the significance of this work, of the power of our feminine energy. It is the power of the goddesses um, within and around us and I just I hope that your journey continues to move you in a way that you can elevate these energies and tap into that wisdom Mm. if you enjoyed this episode please um, leave a comment um, send a message to at gogo ikaya as well shout her out um, and, and share it if it resonates with you If you are interested in learning more about my work, you can do so at sacredliberation.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to connecting with you next time. Tokoza.